This is the Loaded Radio Podcast. All right, hey, how you doing? It's Scott Penfold, and we are back for another edition of the Loaded Radio Podcast. It's the first one of 2024, and it's good to be back, man. It's been a while. I think the last podcast we had was early December, but uh, yeah, back now, back again with an all-new show for you. Hopefully, you're having a good new year thus far. On the show today, a great way to kick off 2024, we have a couple of guests that are going to be joining us. First off, going to be talking with Jolly Carlson, who is the guitar player from the band Bad Omens. You know these guys are, a great badass American band from Richmond, Virginia. And their latest album, The Death of Peace of Mind, dropped in 2022. Big hit for these guys, especially because of the hit Just Pretend. And these guys are going to be hitting the road with Bring Me the Horizon. And uh, yeah, just doing it so well right now. So looking forward to be speaking with Jolly Carlson from the band. And in the second portion of the podcast, I'm going to be speaking one-on-one with the Derision Cult main man Dave McAnally. They're a killer, killer industrial band out of Chicago, and uh, a lot of people involved with this project as well, including Martin Atkins, known for his stuff with Ministry, Nine Inch Nails, Pig Face, and Killing Jokes. So we'll be speaking with Dave from Derision Cult in the second portion of the podcast, as they've got the album Mercenary Notes Part 1 available right now. So let's jump right in, and uh, joining us right now is the guitarist from the band Bad Omens, and of course I'm talking about Jolly Carlson, as this band has been around since 2015, and I've uh, got three albums under their belt, with the latest being The Death of Peace of Mind, a massive hit for these guys, and especially when it comes to the song Just Pretend, which is getting a lot of play everywhere and really, really bringing this band to the forefront of hard rock and metalcore today. they got a big tour coming up with Bring Me the Horizon throughout Europe, and uh, Jolly joins us right now here on the podcast. Jolly, how you doing, man? Thanks for joining us. Oh, cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. No problem at all. Um, I do want to go back a little bit first and sort of build from there. Uh, I do want to go back to the first album and after the band had sort of, you know, formulated. Uh, how was it working with Will Putney on that first album? Uh, it was it was good. I think it was pretty good and interesting. He has a team of good people there. So it was not just him. It was like his guys and they just like kind of try to cater to what we were talking about and what we wanted, you know, how we wanted to sound. And they just uh, did a good job in helping us do that, like, you know, co-producing it, whatever. But no, it was a good experience. Now, coming out of the gate, was it your intention that you guys were, we were going to come out heavy? We were going to come out with this this heavy yeah. sound and Will's the guy? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think we definitely had a pretty heavy sound. And then we were very excited working with Will Putney on our absolute first release and, and the full album like that because, you know, he's a pretty legendary dude when it comes to uh, heavy music and whatnot. So we already knew it was going to be really good. Um uh, but uh, no, it, it was it was great. Uh, and then we through that experience is where we started picking up learning and then like we, we lo- learned a lot of stuff there. And then from there on, we we started self producing. So it was a very good experience for us. Well, was it a deliberate decision to sort of move away from the metalcore sound with uh, the death of peace of mind? Uh, I think it was just we just did what we wanted to do. Honestly, yeah. it was like very hard to think. Like we didn't actively say like if we wanted to go even heavier we would have i just think that we actively just kind of naturally gravitated towards something less uh hectic i guess but um Mm -hmm. still heavy i think we still uh, show parts where we can provide very heavy stuff uh but uh, yeah i don't know we just kind of matured into our own little find our own little pocket and and hold ourselves a little place and and we and we're enjoying it but we're still always trying to reinvent what we're doing so so we never get like settled out this is us we're gonna sound like this forever and that's not what we want to do you know so it's just this is just a journey to be on and it's fun you know in that aspect the next album could be like extremely heavy or it could be like complete departure from that as well it could be absolutely there's no rules we do what we want but uh, you know yeah people have started uh and, and we we as well definitely think that we found something with this last album so we are going to like, you know, make that grow essentially is what I feel. And just take, take the journey from there. And then, um, but with that said, you know, like we had very heavy songs on that album and we love them and we think it's so much fun to play them live and whatnot. And we do come from those roots. So it's fun to always keep a, uh, you know, a toe in that box as well. Totally, man. And, uh, you know, I really like, um, I really like the sound of the band too and the way that it has developed. I mean, there has been a lot of comparisons to the Bring Me the Horizon era, the Zep Eternal era. You guys uh, see that as a good thing or a negative thing? Uh, I think it's no, I think it's probably just a natural thing, man. The, the, who did, wasn't, who wasn't very, um, 
um, inspired by them. Um, and, and then I think they've like most of their songs are really good. Most of their albums have really cool stuff. They're a very successful band. And then, and that speaks for itself. Like I've always enjoyed listening to them even since before that, um, even though I listened to a lot of the other stuff. I think those are one of those bands within metalcore that I actually have listened to um, um, because I enjoy them. Uh, I think it's just good and natural. I don't think that uh, we are like trying to do what they're doing. I think we're definitely doing our own thing. Uh, but then I definitely hear the comparisons. Like sometimes you can hear that, oh, they're inspired by that. And like, yes, we are um, among very a lot of other things. Um, and you can definitely hear that in the first album, right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, when we're coming out of the gates, uh, obviously we were just trying to look up to the best ones and try to have some of that energy, I guess. Well, you guys are going to be actually hitting the road with them. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? You guys hyped for that? Oh, yeah. It's going to be exciting. UK. And um, a lot of good shows. And yeah, absolutely. It's going to be fun. Now, um, to getting into some of the songs from the, the latest album, uh, the song Just Pretend, obviously, just a massive hit off the record. How did that song come about for you guys? Just Pretend, uh, it was more so a little bit of a joke that Noah did when um, he was actually just trying to, like, in two seconds or whatever, uh, write a uh, look at this radio rock butt rock song that we I can do. And then right. and when he presented it, it was very different because he didn't sing like him. It was more just like, you know, trying to sound um, different <laughs> when he was singing it. And, uh, and then, but then we can definitely hear the potential in it at the same time. We were like, holy shit, but it's still not bad. You know, like it's pretty strong. And then uh, we just went more serious with it. And then it just really uh, became a good song. We didn't know how big it's going to be though. I don't like, we, we didn't personally, See this one as our biggest single, I don't think. Uh, that was the people's choice. <laughs> it was yeah. just, a, or, or rather, that was like TikTok's choice, I guess, because right. that's how it got big through. And then through that song, people just find a lot of other songs that, you know, maybe that we had more ammunition on uh, when going out with this album. So, uh, and no, I, I think the whole album is pretty recognized and it's it's been really, really fun to have people enjoy it. And and yeah, in my head, I don't really care how they found it as long as they found it and are enjoying it, you know. Is that a song you enjoy playing live? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's good because everybody knows it. You can definitely like, a lot of people stay for that one, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we play it pretty late in our set, but um, no, it's fun. We, we have a fun set when we make sure that we do. We make sure that we are enjoying ourselves up there and that nothing gets too boring. And if they're too boring, we just won't play those songs, even if they're great and very popular. Like sometimes you'd, like, you'd rather have fun if you got to have to play 30 nights in a row than to realize that like this is not fun. Like, sometimes maybe everybody just don't have a nice time playing a few like older songs that people would like. And we just, nope, we've realize that we don't like it right um yeah what about the title track from the album where did that one come about oh uh, uh yes um it came about out of i think that was one of the ones this was like a a, a lockdown album right and i mm. i live in the i live in the same um house as my singer noah and then um I guess we were just bored and he was just bored because he was walking around the house and he was sampling all bunch of stuff with like a sampler they had um, just, you know, like cu couch cushions and doors squeaking and dog barking and, and all those things. And he made that into a beat sort of, um, he was Twitch streaming at this time. So I think he was uh, using that as a project to show what he can do with just sounds from around the house. Uh, and he made that beat and then he started singing that, um, the, the vocals on it. And that's how it became about, like he had that little thing and they had that vocal hook and he thought it was really good. And then he sent it to me and I just kind of made it more, uh, realistic or I, I, I took all the elements that was just, you know, the stuff around the house and then made it into a real beat essentially, uh, but started like whatever was in there, I was trying to keep, uh, or just change to something else. But I think there's still a dog barking in there and stuff. No, it's a great track too, man. It really came together well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you see how instrumental, how how uh, we were just trying stuff. Like we wasn't really like this wasn't you know we wasn't, we wasn't writing this as if, as if it was going to even go on the album. We were literally just writing everything because it was fun and it was interesting. And uh, and then at the end of the day, we were just like, holy shit, do we have a whole album now? You know, kind of. So and then um, 
So a lot of the songs weren't meant for the, what's been written in like this goes on the album. It was just meant to be written because it was fun and we all enjoyed it. And then that's why it became so good. And that's what I think. Well, now, how does Bad Omens create music? I mean, is it like a together sort of thing or is it like you guys could bring in, in ideas separately? How, how do you guys create? Yeah, it's 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 a uh, little bit of both. Uh, you know, we we're, we're we're always creating by ourselves, but we also have like when we're sitting and creating together uh, in the same room. Like we're in, this, I'm in the studio room right now uh, in our house, and then we're just sitting here and we just take it whatever. Either we're working on someone's idea that they've had for themselves, like you. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times that's how it happens. You get an idea in your head and then maybe your voice memo it down and then maybe you sit with your computer real quick first and throw down the chords and then you make sure that it doesn't suck. And then if you if you like it, I, that's how I do it. And like, I actually like this. And then I go to Noah, whatever. Um, and and we're producing with our other friend, Michael. And I was like, do you guys like this? And then like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then they might t- take some parts. Uh, we take ideas from that. That's like essentially a song starter. Then. And then you can take it from there. And then that's one way. Um, sometimes you just sit in a room and you just start a sample up on the screen and, and then everybody gets to just throw in ideas until you have a song. Yeah. And sometimes that's a really bad song. Sometimes that's an awesome song. It's all about just keep on doing it and enjoying the process. Well, are you guys currently uh, working on new material or are you always sort of working on new material? Like what's going on right now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, right now, we're definitely trying to be creative. <clears throat> we're trying to wrap up some um, uh, some releases. Uh, it's not uh, in any way should perform the new album. Uh, we haven't. Re- we've started working on that, but uh, that's not our uh, upcoming releases. Um, but we, yeah, because uh, we, we do have. <laughs> We always have stuff to do, obviously, because we got to go out and tour. But soon again, it just feels like I just came home from one. Yeah. And then, you know, you've been relaxed and then you haven't really played the guitar for a while. And now I'm just like, oh, I really have to I really have to start practicing again because we're going on the tour again. And then we've been home writing. So, yeah, it's always it's kind of always we don't write much on tour. But when we're home, we're trying to get some ideas going. It's going well. I think it's all uh, all quality and, and good stuff. But it. It's, it's taken its time and it's going to have to, you know? Yeah, certainly, certainly, man. Um, I did want to ask this, though, going back to 2019, what really went down with the whole Amity Affliction Senses Fall Tour in 2019? What happened there? What happened there? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's all, uh, I think that's all uh, explained in the post that we did and everything. It's very queer. Um, and it was just, it was just like, I think it was unnecessarily, um, I'm glad it didn't happen, man. Because if if we weren't on that, we wouldn't have um, we wouldn't really have gotten in to record. But now has become a really really good album. So like yeah. uh, at the at the end of the day, it was just the way it was supposed to be. And I think <laughs> as far as that go, all the information is out there. Um, I haven't even met any one of them yet, so I haven't. I don't know. <laughs> so so, so there's no around. hostility there or anything, then, right? No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. Uh, not from no. Oh, I don't think so. Yeah, I think as far as we're, we're all concerned, it's all buried. Um, and but it, like, I mean, it's a fun little story in our in our journey, I guess. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <It's laughs> I think that was our first. I think that was our first first Billboard mention. Honestly, uh, oh, great, like, cool, that's, dude. That's actually that's actually funny. <laughs> like our first Billboard mention is this petty stuff. I love that. That's a cool thing. And then, <laughs> yeah, and it's like we're definitely not petty at all. But then it's been funny. We had um, a lot of other Billboard stuff lately. And that's can kind of you know shadow that away if you know what I'm saying. Sure, <laughs> All yeah. the attention the film since then has been at least stuff that I can think is good and people can read about and should should pay attention to maybe more than all that dumb stuff. But people like people like drama though. I understand. They do. So you had mentioned that you are working on some new stuff. What's the band up to for the next little while? Of course, you're gonna be hitting the road. What are you guys up to? I mean, you said it. That's it. Like we're we're right now. We're um we've been trying to be a little bit creative right now. We're definitely gonna have to go into practice mode. Try to enjoy the holidays, and then we go out with Bring Me in Europe or in in the UK, uh, and that's gonna be awesome. And after that, we go out on on our by ourselves, and then uh, well, with 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 Poppy, uh, uh, and uh, you know we do Europe, and then we go home for a little bit. And every like I said, every time we're home, we're trying gonna have to try to be a little bit creative, so you're not doing nothing. Uh, but at the same time, stay sane, stay healthy, and and have some time off. And then we do have some pickup shows in April and whatnot. I know, and it's going to be really cool because they've, they've grown a little bit in size since we had to unfortunately had to cancel them on our last headliner. And then we just have them picked up, and then uh, it's going to be great. Probably more bigger, cooler shows. And 
since that is just we have like I'm, i don't know how much we've released and, and as far as we must be released that's all that i know uh, because that's all i really look at i just know that this band controls my life anyway so i don't really need to know where i'm going right but it's going <laughs> it's going to be a, like it doesn't matter like i don't really need to know um but uh yes it's going to be uh some uh fasts i think we're going out with uh in next year in the u.s and uh, some in europe as well and it's gonna gonna be fun beautiful man jolly thank you so much for taking the time really do appreciate it dude and uh i'll see you out yes. there on the road yeah of course dude yeah take care and thank you all the best take care man okay bye-bye and there he is that is joaquin jolly carlson from the band Bad Omens. And yeah, man, the, the new album, I'm telling you, The Death of Peace of Mind is a great list in front to back. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal release. And as well, those guys going to be on the road with Bring Me the Horizon going on throughout Europe in early 2024 here. But this brings us to the second portion of the podcast where I am now being joined by Derision Cult main man, Dave McAnally. Now, the band currently have Mercenary Notes Part 1 available to check out. And if you're into industrial metal or if you're into, like, say, industrial thrash, maybe even call it, I don't really know what to call it, but it's just badass, then definitely I recommend checking out Derision Cult. They're based out of Chicago, and Dave joins us now right here on the podcast. Dave, how you doing, man? Good, good. Uh, Glad to talk about this (laughs) stuff for sure. Um, But uh, first off, Dave, before we get into the band, why did you decide to leave advertising behind and pursue Derision Cult? Um... Well, uh, for me, I, you know, I, I still have a lot of passions for digital marketing and, and the mechanisms of analytics. I'm, I'm always going to be a data nerd at yeah. heart. Sure. Um, so I'm not leaving that. Um, a big reason, you know, I spent a lot of years, um, you know, in, in, you know, there's the big four, you know, ad, ad holding companies. And I spent, you know, a couple decades in that world. Um, you know, a big reason... You know, there there were per, there were some pragmatic reasons, and I think kind of philosophy reasons. The pragmatic ones are, you know, and you're in that business. You know, I know touring and stuff seems big, but that uh, that's like you need to drop everything, and tomorrow you got to be in Germany because there's a big pitch. You know, right? And, and you know, my daughter was just born, and um, you know, so there's some of that was was gnawing on me. Um, but a reason, you know, from a you know, and, and where derision cult kind of comes into play and, and some of the things that we talk about in the tracks are, um, you know, especially in the last decade, you know, advertising kind of, it felt to me like it went from sort of the innocuous, you know, if you drink this beer, the hot chick will like you, or if you use this dishwashing detergent, your neighbors will think you're more European and sophisticated <laughs> to if you buy this product, this makes you, um, this says something about what you believe about racism or what you believe about, uh, you know, who, who, who you are politically. And that really, you know, it's kind of after that first Trump election, I noticed a lot of brands started finding out that, or it seemed like they were capitalizing on that more and, and social issues. And that felt like that really fed into, um, just the, the, Oh, just how polarizing things are, you know, uh, mm-hmm. there's a saying enragement equals engagement. And um, I, I, I really had some misgivings about that because I understood, you know, you know, we, we do we, we show people 18 times the amount of, you know, just stimulus, you know, today that they did 30 years ago, you know, and that has to do with us being on mobile devices and. You know, so we're just we're already overstimulated and to layer that on, I just the room was getting a little too hip for me. And yeah. uh so instead of that, I uh I make angry industrial music now. I checked out Mercenary Notes part one uh in its entirety. Uh, a great release too, man. Um nice. first off, before we get into the album, why the name Derision Cult for the project? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I um that came about because uh I was reading an article. Do you remember that movie, The Room? This came out maybe 2007 or so. And the movie was famous for being so terrible. Yeah, and, I do remember uh, the movie, actually. Yes. <laughs> I read an, I read an, and, and I thought this, um, I, I was reading a, a review of it and, or not so much a review of the movie, but a review of that phenomenon of, uh, something getting popular because people hate it so bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And an author, one of the authors of uh, that was writing this mentioned that this cult of derision around this movie has brought people together. And I thought that was really interesting. And I felt like in a way that was um, kind of represented a lot of what I was doing uh, in marketing was, uh, you know, at least with some of the campaigns towards the end is we were kind of uh, uh, capitalizing on, um, you know, just just people's anger for different social issues and stuff like that to bring them together. And I just thought that whole concept was interesting that uh, people um, coming together and actually building energy off of just hating something. And uh, yeah. that's where it came from. Now getting into mercenary notes, part one, who produced the, the effort there? Like who was um, at the helm for that? Yeah. So that was um, Sean Payne, who is uh kind of the mastermind of all things at glitch mode uh recordings which is uh i want to say it's a label it's more like an artist collective we have here in chicago of uh, like-minded industrial folks and um sean uh had his main project is called cyanotic which is a killer uh industrial uh band here in chicago and yeah sean was really um what I asked him when I first came to him with this and, you know, we've become pretty good friends since, but, you know, I'm kind of at heart a thrash metal guy and oh, I too. wear that on my <laughs> sleeve and I'm proud of it. Me too, dude. I, didn't want, I didn't want mercenary notes to sound like some thrashy guitar player who got a hold of a drum machine one day. You know, I really wanted to make sure that, you know, this really felt like it was coming from an industrial place and, um, I couldn't think of somebody better who's active right now than Sean to partner on this. You know, I really loved, um, you know, there's a couple of cyanotic albums in particular that I really love. There's one called Technoir, um, which funny enough, doesn't even have guitars in it, but um, just the cinematic vibe that he brings to he, particularly that one and this new one that he just put out the after effect. Mm-hmm. So I really wanted to get his guidance on that. And also, um, you know, it was really great working with Sean because I, I'd, I'd kind of been a lone wolf for a long time. And it's, it's, yeah. uh, I, you know, I really, um, I've really come to appreciate just collaborating with people and bouncing ideas off, bringing new things in. Um, and I've done a lot of that with a number of projects lately. So just, just the act of doing that, having people here in Chicago that I can work with has been really valuable. But yeah, Sean did, Sean was the producer, my mercenary notes part one and we're working on part two right now oh well that's cool dude uh, and definitely some good news there because uh, I, the first album um consuming it myself i mean it, it it was really it really i'm gonna say it man you probably heard it before but there are shades of ministry which i love so much and speaking of ministry chris Connolly got involved i was chris involved with the project yeah um well uh that came about because um chris has a is in a band called the joy thieves which actually i guess i'm in that too it's a uh (laughs) a a giant collective of chicago uh industrial uh, luminaries and i want to say there's like 80 band members in it now Uh, (laughs) but uh it revolves around uh, a good buddy of mine named dan milligan who you know is the drummer for uh joy thieves and a bunch of things and we were working on it, that track, which became Death Blood. And it just, you, Chris had done, they, Joy Thieves had put out an album called American Parasite uh, a year and a half ago. And I love that album. And I loved, Chris was almost kind of channeling like Killing Joke in uh, Jazz Coleman and how he, right. you know, his vocal style on that. And I really love that. And when I was, you know, when we, Sean and I were working on that demo, it just, no offense to Chris, but like it just screamed, we need like an angry Scottish guy yelling <laughs> on this thing. And who better to do that than old Chris? So, um, <laughs> you know, reached out to Dan and, uh, you know, hey, do you think, you know, Chris would be into this? And uh, he connected us. And, you know, the funny thing about Chris was um, he, he, he turned that around so fast. I think it was like a Wednesday. Uh, I had that initial exchange between him, Dan, and uh, myself. Mm -hmm. He cut that vocal and had it pretty much fully formed with all the layers and everything by Saturday morning. Oh, nice. (laughs) uh, Yeah, it was awesome. It kind of sounded like, um, you know, it kind of connected with some things he wanted to do. So, 
Yeah, that absolutely worked out brilliantly having Chris involved. And um, there's a few other ministry luminaries on there too. Um, you know, Chris did the vocals of Deaf Blood. Martin Atkins did a remix of that track. Oh, cool. um, so that's Pig Face, Nine Inch Nails, Ministry. He was on the, uh, in case you didn't feel like showing up a uh, live video, that's Martin playing drums on that. Um, huh. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, and it, it, I guess that all kind of comes from us all being a bunch of Chicago guys. Yeah. Well, certainly so. And, and I got to bring up Reeves Gabriels, man, the fact that he was yeah. on there too. How did that happen? Yeah, that was a real thrill having him on. And he's actually, um, he just cut a bunch of stuff for part two as well. Um, oh, great. Um, for those who don't know, by the way, Reeves is from The Cure. Um, very, very cool, though. Yeah, how, how was he, how did you get him involved in the project? Well, uh, The Cure, and then, you know, he was uh, David Bowie's guitarist in the 90s. And- That's right. For me, that was like my gateway drug into a lot of this music. Like my kind of, you know, before, honestly, before Tin Machine, I thought g- cool guitar playing started and stopped the likes of Dave Mustaine and Slash and, you know, nothing against those guys. But I remember seeing Tin Machine on like a, oh, some MTV thing. And, you know, Reeves is getting all these crazy noises out of guitars. And it was just like, there was kind of like every, a switch flipped in my head and he also um and then david bowie did that tour with nine inch nails so i really yes. got into bowie then and that's really so reeves has been like a hero of mine for a long time and uh it always been in my mind and i saw him do a couple solo gigs in the early 2000s right after he left bowie um so i kind of had a bit of a you know as a fan a bit of a you know a familiar face with him you know mm-hmm. and, uh, you know years went on i i kind of drifted away from music for a while as i was doing the ad agency stuff um but honestly that worked out by i just uh just reached out to him again and i you know explained how uh you know these tracks we were working on the things that he was doing on outside and earthling those two bowie albums that are you know, just amazing that he, he co-produced with Bowie. Um, you know, we we're looking for some sounds like that. And it just so happened. Um, that was right when that Omicron remember when COVID kind of came roaring back uh, yes. a couple of years ago. So he was kind of stuck in New York and wasn't able to go mix um, cures in the middle of mixing some tracks. So he just had all this downtime. So he was like, well, yeah, why not? <laughs> and, um, uh-huh that turned out awesome and you know him and uh so he recorded those tracks and him and uh you know his wife susan have just been you know the sweetest nicest people um you know just helping us promote things and all that uh went and saw the cure when they were in chicago um this summer and god the new stuff sounds awesome i can't wait for that album to come out some of the tracks i wanted to ask you about in particular like tell me about the song slaves rebuild man that's badass yeah thanks well yeah reeves is on that um that uh we just did a video for that and uh it um you know that's it's funny enough that's actually the one that uh when we uh when i first brought all these demos to sean that was uh that was the track that uh he uh, that uh sean really gravitated to because the demo was all just acoustic guitars and a bit of a drum machine. And so it's pretty different from everything else. But, um, and then Sean, you can really hear some of that cinematic, you know, kind of really wide sound that uh, I was hoping Sean would bring on that track totally. uh, yeah. in particular, cause it, you know, there's a lot of room in it. Um, but beyond that, um, that track to me really, we were in, that was really inspired by, I think all the diet fads and, you know, lifestyle coaching things that, um, you know, we're expected people kind of become slaves to, you know, just everyday things. I, um, I recently, uh, cut sugar out of my diet. The reason I did it was just, you know, some getting older, but, um, you know, I have a lot of friends who are following the fads for diets and, you know, well, you got to have the, you know, you got to buy these expensive juicers and stuff. And right. it just struck me like, and, and those are like, they change every week, you know, it's they like <laughs> every week. 
I, that whole kind of being stuck in those weird cycles of just everyday life um, really inspired that. And we actually were doing a, um, there's a part two of that track that's going to be on Mercenary Notes part two. And Reeves is on that one as well. Uh, you know, another song that really jumped out to me, I liked was uh, The Year Hope Failed. What can you tell me about that track? That's actually a demo I had around for a while. Um, and it's so funny because, uh, you know, that track, if you listen to it, you could tell it, um, you know, it kind of has to do with uh, some of the fears around AI, you know, replacing people's jobs or right. making uh, humans obsolete. And we actually, it's funny enough, we dropped that single the day before Chat GPT came out. Funny serendipity how that works, but um, that track, uh, you know, that was uh, from when I was in the agency world, we were talking about using generative AI um, maybe about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, back then, the concerns, you know, and, and we really, I really, I personally really did replace some jobs with, uh, you know, automation and stuff. I mean, we ended up creating new roles out of that because we were freeing up time. But the interesting thing is we, I drew samples from a speech that a uh, colleague of mine gave. Um, so when you hear, you know, the, you know, talking about the machines are, don't make any mistakes. The machines are perfect. I heard that was a recording I had from a speech from a, from a, basically a meeting about eight years ago. So that wasn't, um, you know, that, that was, that was fresh off. And that was a mic. That's actually a Microsoft engineer talking, you know, some of the things they were developing and what is this, what he was doing was yelling at all these agencies saying, Hey, you guys are going to be out of a job because, yeah. uh, <laughs> this, you know, you're never going to be able to, you know, discern the patterns and data like a AI will. So he, and he was offering some suggestions for how we could partner to still add value. So, and it just so happened, I still had my notes and my recordings from that. So I was like, this fits perfectly to what we're trying to say here. That's awesome. Uh, and Dave, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk to us here on Loaded Radio, man. Really do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for Mercenary Notes Part 2, dude. That's uh, it's going to be great. Awesome, man. Thanks. Yeah, we're shooting for like uh, late spring, early summer on that one. Good stuff. Uh, Dave, thanks again, man. Well, thanks a lot, Scott. <laughs> no worries, Dave. Take care. All the best to you, man. All right. We'll see you. That's Dave McAnally from Duration Cult. Check out Mercenary Notes Part 1. It's strongly recommended. A very cool listen, especially if you're into industrial. I'm telling you, it's just so great. Don't forget, check out LoadedRadio.com, okay? On a daily basis for all your hard rock and metal news, constantly updated. All right? Also, past episodes of this podcast there for you as well. And, of course, the 24-hour live radio stream with live personalities and uh, interviews. Tons of great stuff. Of course, hey, tons of hard rock and metal. You download the Loader Radio app. It's completely free wherever you get your apps. So you can literally carry all that stuff in your pocket with you wherever you go. Definitely worth a download if you're all about hard rock and metal because we got you, okay? But I'm Scott Penfold, and we'll talk to you again next week on another edition of the Loader Radio podcast. Loaded Radio.